Hello, everybody. Chief Patrol Agent Ryan Landrum here at the U.S. Border Patrol Academy coming to you with another What's Important Now podcast. On the WIND podcast, we dedicate a lot of time and effort into speaking with senior executives and chief patrol agents uh, from across the U.S. Border Patrol enterprise. But in reality, there's only about 141 senior executives service employees for all of Customs and Border Protection, not just Border Patrol, but all of CBP. Equally, there's about a thousand GS-15s for all of CBP. Nevertheless, the laws of probability for somebody to achieve that rank are not very high. Given that we are over 60,000 employees in all of CBP, when you parse it down to 1,141 upper level leaders in the organization, not everybody's gonna make it to those positions. That being said, rank and insignia on somebody's collar does not equate to leadership. We are a rich organization that has leaders throughout our ranks, from Border Patrol agent all the way to SES, Chief of the U.S. Border Patrol. Today, I have with me Supervisory Border Patrol agent, Course Developer Instructor, also with the title of Commander of Agents at the U.S. Border Patrol Academy, Mirna Gonzalez. Mirna, welcome. Thank you so much, Chief. It's an honor to be here and spend time with you today and talk to you. I appreciate the opportunity. Yes, thank you. So that lead-in kind of really defines what I want to talk to you about. Okay. You're not a senior executive chief. You're not a GS-15, this, that, or the other, but you're still a very highly respected leader in this organization. Well, thank you. And I want to walk back to uh, July 2002. You remember those those years? Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, good. All right, so you you were a member of class 519. You were the section leader, which already kind of starts to identify that you're a leader in the organization. We, we pull out folks from within the ranks of those classes to lead your other classmates. So you're still going through the same type of uh, uh, classes and academy rigor that everybody else is. I'm just adding responsibility onto your shoulders yes. to help kind of police everybody in that class. So literally from day one, you're identified as a leader, right? So if you remember 519, do you happen to remember your uh, class chat? Oh my goodness. Defend the border as a team. We're the mighty 519. Oh, where, where did you go to the academy? I went to Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina. So we talk about this a lot. We back in back in those days, the early 2000s, leading into 2006, five, six ish. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of had a, a bifurcated training system. We trained some agents in Charleston, South Carolina. We trained other agents in Glencoe, Georgia, where the uh, both federal law enforcement training center facilities. We just had so much volume going through the academy at one time that no one uh, location ge geographically could handle that type of volume. So we kind of had to do a split. You went to uh, Charleston. I was in uh, Glencoe about a couple of years uh, before that. But you first start off at the Brackettville Station. I started off in Del Rio Sector and Uvalde Station, and that Uvalde was Uvalde Station. Yes, sir. And Chief, it was amazing. Awesome. Tell I me went, about it. <laughs> I went there in 2002, and uh, when I, I I arrived, there was only about three or four f other female agents. Wow. And um, they didn't know what to think of me. <laughs> um, they said, are you, are you like so-and-so or are you like so-and-so? They mentioned uh, female agents' names. Uh -huh. This was my first day. I didn't know. Right. I said, well, I really don't know what you're talking about. I said, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my best. Yeah. And so I went in there um, very, very motivated and, and did my best every day and did things that, that I enjoyed doing, um, which was I joined the sign cut unit very early on, and then time just flew by. Um, by the time you knew it, a couple of years had flown by, and I made some very close friends. Yeah. And uh, that was that was a beginning. That was a launching pad uh, of my happiness. Honestly, I've I've been in 20 years, like you said, and um, I'm happier now than I ever have been my entire career. Awesome. And I've had some extraordinary extraordinary times in my career. I've had the opportunity to do a lot of things yeah. and meet wonderful people, and that's where it all started. Yeah. We were very very close. So interestingly, so you say, are you going to be like agent so-and-so or agent so-and-so? I, right. I, what I'm going to gather there, deduce, is that maybe they were suggesting that one particular agent was a hard worker and maybe the other particular agent was not. Yes, that's exactly right. And they were kind of sizing me up. Yeah. And I said, oh, here we go. That's right. You know, they, I was sized up at the academy. I'm, this is the, the way it's going to go. I'm going to do my best. 
So you said you're on the sign cutting unit, right? Yes. What, why, why is that significant? What's like, when you talk about getting on a detail very early in your career, I think contextually speaking is, uh, details of, when I say detail, right? You're doing something other than the traditional border patrol agent line or checkpoint duties. And you're off on a, maybe a specialty unit. Uh, maybe it's prosecution, sign cutting, horse patrol, canine, those types of things. Why is in 2002 is going on a sign cutting unit as a female, uh, important. Chief, I wanted to challenge myself. I liked, uh, I saw this unit as an elite unit. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I started asking around, can I join that unit? Well, after you're on probation, you can give it a try. But you shouldn't, pr you should probably wait for something like that. And I didn't listen. I, I went for it and I got on the unit. Yeah. And uh, wow, the men and women on that unit were extremely skilled. They were highly motivated. They were seeing things in the on the ground that I never even thought somebody could see um, their apprehensions were very high. They were very, very close knit unit because they were very small. The Uvalde station at the time was only 86 agents. Wow. Sign cutting unit was six to eight. Yeah. So um, these men and women were ex just exceptional in what they did. I looked up to them, I admired them. Yeah. I wanted to be like them. Um, so we were very competitive. <laughs> um, once after a couple years of being on it, I, I, uh, I almost, I was like a dog with a bone. You could not get me off a sign <laughs> yeah. because I was going to follow that thing until it, it was, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about who I was and I learned a lot about how not to be because I was so focused on the job. I forgot to turn it off when I went home. So I was, I was a hundred percent on, on at work, high, high producer, high productivity, um, the accolades and the things we got within our unit, it felt great. At home, I was having dinner and I was thinking about that. I wasn't thinking about who was sitting across from me. I've been in a relationship at that time for 10 years. And this person had, had the patience to wait for me and all this time to go through the academy, the move, being away from me for six months, uh, going to a small town, uh, going through all of the things they were patient the entire time and loving and supportive. And I didn't see them. Mm -hmm. I never saw them until it was too late. So there's some interesting takeaways there. Like this is, this is a, kind of a, a, a master class in some things to do and some things not to do. Right. Right. So number one, and I, I tell trainees this all the time because we get these types of questions you know, when can I do this? When can I do that? I have the aspiration to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. um, I tell them also, you're going to get to your station. There's going to be journeymen out there. Supervisors are going to say, hey, Mirna, chill out. Right. You know, you know, you can do this whenever you've earned the opportunity to do that. And usually that means time. You spent time. And there's some val validity to that. You have to be a good board of choice first. And you have to understand your job before you can get on a sign cutting like unit, right? But I also tell them, don't listen. If you have those aspirations, the worst that can happen is somebody tells you no. That's right. Right. But at least you can go home at night and say, I tried. They said, no, I'll keep doing my job and try again next time. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. That's it. The second part, and I kind of alluded to it already is at our core, we have to be good border patrol agents first. Along with that becomes being a good teammate as well. When you get into a unit of six or eight people, like, you know, very quickly, you know, who, which agent you are, right? right. Yes. Are you agent so-and-so or agent, you know, so-and-so. Um, so in, in, in pursuit of your aspirations and, and your desire to do things that you want to do in the organization, it all kind of starts with being a really good border patrol agent. And that means being a really good teammate first. Right. Yeah. Yes. And then number three, obviously, um, you know, and, and granted we have, we, we, it's very easy to look through the 2022 lens of, mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, time and space gives us the opportunity to reflect on things we did right and wrong. Uh, over time, but when you look back and, you know, 2022, you're a brand new border patrol agent and you, you know, you're a hard charger and you want to do all these things, but you also have to remember that it's not about you. Right. Right. There's so much more to life. There's so, you know, the families are neglected uh, and you, it's very easy to be consumed with yourself yeah. and say, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm the most important, important person in this household. Why don't you see that versus, Hey, really? partner X, Y, or Z, right. you're actually the most important person in this household, Yes, right? You are the most important person in this household. And when you have me and I have you in those, in those times, 
um, I need to respect that and vice you respect me, if you will, with, because I'm a border patrol agent, I'm gonna sign cutting you. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yes. It's awesome. a give and take. That's right. And uh, it's and it's balance. And I didn't know balance. <laughs> I did not know any kind of any sort of the, the I did not even uh, come close to being balanced. Yeah. When I, and early on in my career, and I had to learn. Yeah. I had to learn the hard way. That had great journeyman agents. Uh, gave me great advice. Uh, don't ever put it in reverse and drive backwards mm-hmm. when you can drive forward. They said, don't buy a brand new pickup right out of the gate. Don't yeah. ever. And I said, and what did I do? I yeah. did all of the things wrong, <laughs> just like we all do. Yeah. But it's, I it's easy. I had the patrol. same kind of story. I was a, I was a canine handler very early on, and that is all I wanted to do. That was my entire focus. Um, I wasn't in the same situation personally with you know with a, a long term relationship, but um, I, I get, definitely can sympathize with you know the kind of the all gas no brakes on the career kind of thing, um, and you know it probably affected you a little bit differently with the, with the relationship. I'm guessing oh, in the yeah. end, it sure did, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, but it's it's an easy easy thing to fall victim to for sure, and it's easy to sit here and listen to us talk about it. Everybody kind of has to experience that for themselves, That's right? True. Make those mistakes for themselves. But you know, if you if you listen to one thing, it's you know, we've been there, done that. Don't don't neglect the people at home. It's yes. a huge piece for us. It's it's enormous, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do anything I do without the people at home supporting yeah. me. Yeah, and that's what I tell the students. You say, "Ma'am, you have any words of wisdom?" Yes, don't do what I did at the beginning <laughs> of my career. That's right. Go home and focus on those folks that were at at home that love you. Yeah, give them your undivided attention. They deserve it. Yeah, work's always going to be there. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, in two thousand and four, you're still in Uvalde. Yes, sir. Yeah. So then you start. Um, applying for the honor guard i did right tell me a little bit about what honor guard is in 2002 2004 i should say and um why you applied well that was a very young uh team um and when we'd have an uh awful things happen at sector like a, a line of duty death um there wasn't really a, a lot of structure put into it and so uh, the chaplains were working with the peer support members and honor guard, and they would go and they would initiate the f- contact with the widow or the mm-hmm. family members. And we didn't have the training that we do today. Mm-hmm. And so it was a little bit crude and a little bit we were kind of figuring out on the fly mm-hmm. and trying to be as respectful as possible. Mm-hmm. And I saw my brothers and sisters uh, being great Border Patrol agents, but also dedicating an enormous amount of time to the fallen. Mm-hmm. And I said, Wow. And, and look at look at how well put together they are and look how sharp they look. And then I said, well, I can do this. Mm-hmm. I w- I've been marching since I was 15 in the marching band. The of your own drum, right? That's correct. <laughs> 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 and so I said, I can do this. Um, and so and then I went to the academy, uh, the Honor Guard Academy for two weeks. Yeah. And it was hard. Mm-hmm. It was difficult. It was one of the most difficult things I've ever done. Wow. And I said, no, no, I, I understand. I understand why they're so difficult on us and why this training is so hard because of what's at stake. Yeah. You have to be mentally tough and not wander off or daydream when you have to be in the, in the moment and really realize what you are there for. Yeah. Um, and all of the training and all of the standing and all of the precision, the hours of work on your uniform and the hours of practice, it all pays off if you give the widow or the family one minute of peace and yeah. one minute of okay i really appreciate what you all did and you brought me a lot of joy in, the, in my heart to know that my loved one was never left alone right. and all of it was worth it all of it is worth it for that one little and so it's hours and hours and hours of sacri- sacrifice um, for moments like that yeah. so the honor guard really <clears throat> they they're a representation of who we are they you guys get to do a lot of really cool things, a lot of fun things, and you get to be televised nationally at the, on the 50-yard line of the Dallas Cowboys football game, for example, and, and it's it's very uh, honorable and prestigious, and it carries a certain weight with it. People see that, and they have that same reaction. Wow, those guys are put together. Mm-hmm. Um, they do a great job. You know, the, everybody was in sync. The marching was great. The you know the the uh, pipes and drums were very very uh, inspirational and very cool. Um, but on the back end. We also dedicate a lot of their time, like you mentioned, to paying respects to our fault. Yes. Right. So do me a favor and kind of characterize for the audience. When you're there, you're at a funeral. Somebody has given the ultimate sacrifice for their nation. Right? What does 
what does it look like? What does it feel like when you're honoring those people? Well, that's a great question. Um, and all of us, unfortunately, have had to go to so, so many. Mm-hmm. When we arrive, if we just feel like it's another, another service, we need to quit mm-hmm. the team. Because this family and, and the friends and the colleagues of the long deserved everything we've got. Yeah. So we show up uh, two two days early and we practice and we and we go to the side of the burial and we ha- and we're going through everything in our mind and every all of the things that we need to do precisely and then a lot of things come up. We want to always make sure that it's perfect for the family. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times the family is there and we're, we remain professional in front of them. And we want to make sure that their loved one is put is laid to rest um, appropriately with honor. Yeah. And no two memorial services have ever been the same. Mm-hmm. They're very, very impactful. They're very, very beautiful, and they're awful at the same time. Yeah. Because you have to stand, watch over their loved one when um, before the service. Yeah. Um, our brothers and sisters are at the at the uh, mortuary. And a lot of times we're called in to go and prepare the uniform. And then the viewing starts and the family's there. Mm-hmm. But it's not our time to mourn, mm-hmm. even though we want to. Yeah. And then we guard our loved one, our, our brother and sister, at the head and at his feet or her feet. And we cannot show emotion. And a lot of times their children will come up and they will latch on to us and they will say, Dad or Mom. Or they will just respond to us because we're dressed like the parent that's in the coffin. Mm-hmm. And we want to break down, but it's not our time. Yeah. It's our time to stand strong um, for them. And then we go to the back and we have an emotional we have emotional moments. But at the service, that's our time. That's our time because we're the Border Patrol's only ceremonial burial unit. Yeah. And we're going to shine. We're going to shine. It's interesting because I talked about leadership in the beginning, right? That's leadership, mm. right? You have to maintain this stoic presence. Uh, you have to maintain this representation of our organization, uh, even though there's an emotional charge to it. So are you, you know, wearing two stars in your collar and leading or giving a eulogy, for example? No, right? But the more important leader in the room are the people standing, performing on our watch over our fallen brother and sister. So there's a, there's a theme here. It's all about leadership, right? The rank doesn't make the make the leader. It's what you do with it. That's right. Those opportunities that come, are you prepared to answer that call? So perfectly personified. I appreciate that very much. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> even within Honor Guard, right, there are opportunities. Uh, you can be a, uh, a flag bearer. Um, you can be a, uh, a piper, play the pipes, right? Uh, the bagpipes, you can uh, be a drummer. And I think you kind of hit it on it up front. Back in, you know, the early 2000s, we had an honor guard team and it was, you know, it was cool to do, um, but we didn't really have a whole lot of drums. We didn't have a whole lot of pipes, uh, those types of things. And over the last 20 years, uh, in many instances, unfortunately, we've had to kind of aggressively mature yes. uh, that particular unit based on the number of folks that we've lost specifically. But tell me a little bit about your experience with in Honor Guard. What all have you done? I think you've, I mean, pretty much you can, can you play pipes? I can't. I tried one time. You tried one time. Because I always make fun of the pipers because I'm a drummer. Yeah. And they said, well, try it. And yeah. I did. And I didn't get one note out. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> yeah. I Don't legitimately I have that. no idea how those things work. Like, it just boggles my mind. But the music that comes out is beautiful. And, is. uh emotional at the same time. Like, that. I'll tell you what, that's the, the you, go to a, you go to a service funeral um, between, you know, obviously taps really is, you know, it's kind of heart wrenching, but those bagpipes start playing and you just, it, if you don't, uh, have some emotion in you, you, you know, like to yes. your point, maybe you should hang it up. Yes. Yeah. So absolutely. anyway, what do you, you're a drummer. I am a drummer. Um, I, I didn't start out that way. I started out on the honor guard team and, mm-hmm. um, I'm, uh, I would love to be tall enough to carry our, yes. our flag, but I'm not. So I restricted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I carried the rifle a lot. And uh, and Me I too. would, <laughs> and I saw one of our very one of our most talented pipers in the patrol. He was in Del Rio sector with me, mm-hmm. 
and he was at an Eagle Pass station, and I would watch him practice, and I would watch his dedication, and I would watch the reaction of the people to him and how the families would react to him. I said, I want to be part of his unit. And then I saw him interact with, and I went to a line of duty death for my, the first time and saw the band. I said, that's where I want to be. That's exactly where I want to be. I want to be a drummer, and, uh, and I'm going to give it everything I've got. I was a musician um, in high school, and I was a drum major, so I naturally got a natural rhythm. Um, but playing the drums is difficult. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Marching and drumming at the same time is yeah. not, not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. And the patrol uh, sent us to school for a couple of weeks at the Balmoral uh, Pipes and Drums, and we we met world-class, world-class pipes and drummers there, and pipers and drummers, and uh, they they made us better. And uh, we, <laughs> I was telling Sabrina earlier that that we went to go watch a show, and the grade one, those are the pros, they came on, and this gentleman came on stage, and when he struck his bagpipe and all the drones turned on, it, the sound filled that entire auditorium, and he could have just played the scale. Right. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I turned to my friend that I thought was a good piper. I said, is that what they're supposed to sound like? <laughs> and he said, I don't appreciate that. I'm just joking. Yeah. But <laughs> it's, it's funny you say it tongue-in-cheek, but a part of who Mirna Gonzalez is uh, and a part of her leadership style um, is humor. Yes, really, it is. Uh, if you're, and I, I like the way you characterize it. Our friends, you're having the the most fun of your career. Oh, you know, yes. 20, 20 years later, um, and I and I can tell you from my position, you know, walking in and seeing you every day uh, makes my day better too. And it's usually involving some kind of um, laughter of some sort. Some of it's like, I don't know what I just heard, but you know, we're, I'm yes. gonna see, you know, come brief me later, kind of thing, or or you know, telling old old stories from from back in the day, but. Uh, it's, it, it continues to maintain this theme of, of what a what a true leader looks like, and, and, and the uh, you know you can have the, all the acumen in the world uh, and have performed different things along your career, but if you can't uh, keep it real, no. keep it personal, um, and, and keep it uh, funny, then nobody's gonna follow you. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're a uh, a drummer. Are you just one kind of drummer, or is there several kinds of drummers in the honor guard? Uh, there's three. There's three a, kinds of drummers. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there's a, a bass drummer, a tenor drummer, and a snare drummer. Okay. And I started out with the snare drum and um, went to the bass, and then I saw how fun it is to play the tenor, and I said, I want to do that too. And yeah. So I learned. So my primary instrument is a bass and tenor. Awesome. But um, the, the men and women I'm surrounded with, uh, they're, they're extraordinary musicians. Mm -hmm. um, we went to um, compete. The Border Patrol competed. Um, a couple of years, um, and, and we went against professional bands. Mm -hmm. And we, we went, and we were going to just try it. We'd never done anything like that, and uh, we got third place. Wow. And so the other bands were coming up, where are you, Where? what station are you guys out of? And we said, oh, no, it's not one station. We're from all over the country. Yeah. They didn't believe us. <laughs> they said, how do you practice? And we said, well, we Skype each other, and we, we over the phone we have videos, and then we rehearse online yeah. when we see each other. Uh, at a funeral, unfortunately, then we will pull something together. And they said, Th that's, <laughs> that's, that's unheard of. Yeah. That's unheard of. Because w w imagine if we went out and played music and we sounded awful with this patch on. Yeah, right. No, no. Uh, uh, we're not going to do that. We're not going to. We're going to represent the patrol yeah. with pride. And w when we go and we honor our fallen, we're going to play the best we can, yeah. the best that we can. There's a, there's a couple things in there uh, to, to kind of threads to pull on, if you will. But kudos to, to the devotion of the team members. I think that's that team particularly, um, they take their, like, you don't get extra pay for this, by the way. No. Right? You just do this as a what we call a collateral duty. Yes. Uh, maybe you have an interest in it. Maybe you've you know, grown up in a, in a musical environment and you're looking just to uh, continue to expand upon that, that knowledge in other ways, doing by pipes and drums and stuff like that but super dedicated. And it takes a lot to <clears throat> have no other intrinsic motivation other than being the best representative of the U.S. Border Patrol you can possibly be, and, and in many cases, CBP, all of CBP. Um, secondly, I think some credit obviously goes to the organization. Um, you mentioned you know, going to schools and this type of thing. Um, we dedicate a portion of our operating budget every single year to ensuring that you guys are prepared to represent us, right? 
So clearly money goes to the southwest border, northern border, coastal border operations. We have to do that. Of course we do, right? There are things within, even in austere environments, where money is not necessarily uh, flowing as as um, greatly in, 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 in that year as it maybe has in, in other years or, you know, to earmark money for these types of things becomes harder. But the organization maintains this commitment to making sure we have the most robust possible team to honor, the, specifically to honor the fallen, Yes. right? Absolutely. There's no, there's no expense uh, that we will spare within reason, right? To ensure that that team is ready. That's absolutely right, and it brings me. It brings us so much honor to be there and and play and right. do the things we. I, sometimes I can't believe I get paid to, to go and play the drums for the patrol, yeah. and to go and stand and and represent us like that and meet uh, the families of the fallen. Those families have shaped me mm-hmm. uh, tremendously. Yeah. Uh, the, those families have impacted my life and my career. How could they not? H- hands down. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. Yes. I very much appreciate it. Um, so in 2007, you're still in New Valley, yes. right? And you get the opportunity to come on a detail uh, to Artesian, New Mexico as a operations slash law instructor. Yes, yeah? sure did. Tell me about that. Oh, <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to take an opportunity to do something a little different and come to the academy. Right. And, and when, I, when I went and joined the law department, um, I said, oh, I knew within the first day, I said, this is where I belong. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh my goodness, we have a huge uh, opportunity to impact the future. Yeah. Now I need to get into the books and I need to learn law mm-hmm. so that I can get up there in the front of the class and do and do a good job because these students are sharp, they're smart, they're going to ask good questions yeah. and they're going to challenge you. And uh, there's so only so many times that you can get away with saying, you know what, that's a good question, let me get back to you yeah. <laughs> before they're like, <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> let me ask somebody else. We're off else. script now. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So that t- that taught me a lot. Uh, so the opportunity came up uh, to um, become a supervisor in 08, and I, I jumped at that. Yeah. I sure did. And these are busy years. Um, yes. I, this is actually where uh, our our paths first cross. Yes, it uh, I was a uh, supervisor, board of tours, and course developer instructor in 2007 uh, as well, and you were on detail. Um, and we were going, this is in a major hiring push for the U.S. Border Patrol. I think we were doing, uh, for context, we were running about 98 to 100 classes every fiscal year. Mm-hmm. Uh, today, we run anywhere from 28 to 40. So double to triple the amount of classes that, that we do now, we were doing back then. Um, so going back to that humor piece, right, we had to keep it, you know, pretty light because yes, we, uh, we were running in all sorts of directions we sure were. Uh, and you know trying to trying to act like we knew what we were doing mm-hmm. right but with that kind of volume it was uh, it was unprecedented at the time but the crew that that made up the operations and law department back then I think really made it what it was uh, just being able to uh, keep it keep it light you know be humans about it yes. and uh, to your point you know you're right. This is probably the, the operations slash law department back then. It's probably the one discipline where you really have to study as much as that student. That's right. Uh, we, we owe it to the next generation mm-hmm. to be familiar with the material we're trying to present. That's that's our requirement. We don't take this job very lightly. Um, and quite frankly, there was a charge to uh, increase the number of board agents. And a lot of that fell to, to law and ops. They had to know what they were doing. They really did. Yes. Right. We had to study hard. Mm-hmm. So in 2008, you become a, a course developer instructor. How long did you do that for? I did that for the entire uh, five-year NTE. I was here for five years, and yeah. I was a lead for over 21 classes. 21 classes. And, uh, so NTE wow. is a not to exceed. Yes. So it's a temporary promotion, per se, uh, and you get a three- to five-year term, uh, and you have the ability to perform not only as an instructor, but this is where you start to learn how to supervise people. Yes. Right? It's a, it's a really interesting environment, especially as a CDI, a course developer instructor, is you're, you're technically leading the detailers, right? So you're kind of the super first line supervisor for the agents who have come in on detail to teach uh, the, the, the classes, but you're also kind of the supervisor slash, you know, godmother to the classes, yes. right? The, the bond between a operations instructor and a class is usually 
pretty intense and pretty close comparatively to other disciplines that don't see them as much. You're almost charged with uh, shepherding that entire class through their entire uh, time here with us at the academy, whether it's 07 or you know 2022. Ops kind of has the lead to make sure those classes are where they're supposed to be. If there are any administrative issues that come up, Ops handles those, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And again, going back to you know, you kind of felt this. It seems like you have callings in life. You know, you want to be on the sign cutting unit because you want to do something bigger. You want to be on on pipes and drums and, and honor guard because you want to do something bigger. You come to the academy, you want to do something bigger, and that is shaping the next generation of border patrol agents. So, how was your first five years? Oh my goodness, it went by in a blur, yeah. and uh, I learned a lot along the way, uh, a lot what not to do and how not to do it, and how to um, and how to lead carefully. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I had to really uh, tread lightly, and uh, I said I I kept thinking, um, well, I would love to go to the border patrol academy. I think that I'm ready. But I didn't feel qualified right. until I came as a detailer, and I said, "I think I can do this." Um, but I was always a, a little bit hesitant to do it because I would, I would at that time I'd only had been six six years or so, and so I didn't feel everyone around me was saying, "Listen, don't put in for supervisor until you got ten years in." What are you What are you thinking? Putting in for supervisor, yeah. and I, I didn't listen to them, and I yeah. went for it. There's a theme there. Yes. <laughs> But we were so busy all the time. Um, I wanted to do my best for every single class and every single situation. Every and I started spreading myself too thin. Yeah. And I did not know how to delegate. And I didn't want to do it. I did not want to delegate. I wanted to do it myself. And that was a lot. That was a, a lesson I learned mm-hmm. that you cannot do it all yourself. And you need to trust the people that you work with and yeah. work the, the folks that work for you. And I and I, I learned my lesson. When I was juggling five classes at the same time and six collateral duties and helping the chief out with some uh, missions, and um, I went into class, I turned the PowerPoint on, and I put on uh, immigration law day 23, deportabilities. And I look at the class, and they're, they look at me scared, and they start flipping through their notes, and, and I start teaching. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, it's clear that you're all unprepared. <laughs> it was the wrong class. Nice. I was supposed to be teaching. Uh, nationality law. <laughs> so they were, I said, I'm sorry. I said, uh, this is the wrong classroom. Um, I'm next door. <laughs> and there's like, whew, you know, but that's how busy we were. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's how, that's how quick everything was. And so we were learning on the fly. There's detailers that came in that were supervisors in the field. Right. We had to learn how to manage them. Oh, and by the way, they were mandated to come and they didn't want to be here. Right. So that was another dif- a different story. Mm-hmm. So everyone, you, we had to mold and shape our leadership style. Because you want them to want to be part of the team right. and not say, well, no, you're going to do that because I said so. Well, that's not going to hold water. Yeah. That's not going to hold water. I think the, the theme there for me is that kind of leaders enable their teams. They don't command them. That's right. Right, And that's pretty much central from my perspective to the way you lead is you're an enabler. I rarely ever see you command, like, you will do this because I said so. Right. No. There, are, there are situations that call for that. Right. Very, very clearly. This is life and death. This is um, uh, accountability, those types of things. But otherwise, you really want to build the team based on trust. Right. You, you build this kind of shared consciousness with that team. They, they all understand what we're trying to achieve. You're communicating that you're consuming you know, their concerns as well. And then when everybody's in alignment, you empower them to lead. And I think that's really kind of characterizes who you are as a leader. Absolutely. I- I want to, if, if I'm not teaching someone what I know, yeah. then what good am I? Yeah. It, 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 I know of a couple of people that are very knowledgeable, mm-hmm. but will not share the knowledge yeah. because they want to feel more important. Or No, I like the feeling that when people come to you, if it, when you know all this stuff, no, share that knowledge. Right. That way everybody's better. Yeah. And you'll still be thought of in a, in, in a high regard. Yeah. That's what we should all aspire to. Mercy. Yeah. <laughs> so in 2013, you did you do your five years as a CDI. You go out to El Centro. Yes. What do you do in El Centro? Well, that's an interesting story. Okay. Um, yeah. In 2010, I was someone of a, a, a high rank uh, came to me and said, "What are you doing? Mm-hmm. Um, you should you need to be a, a watch commander or this, or, and you need to start on this career progression, and and you need to come to Washington." Mm-hmm. And I said, "Ooh, um, I'm gonna have to take some time." Uh, that was a, my career was at a crossroads there. Um, 
when I look at you and I see your career progression and what you've accomplished and all that you have gone through to get to where you are, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I knew you back then. I know what you're capable of, and here you are. It makes sense. You worked hard. Here you are. My career progression doesn't make any sense to <laughs> most people. <laughs> it really doesn't. Yeah. Because people will say, well, you've been in 20 years. You're a supervisor, mm -hmm. and you have these qualities. What are you doing? Yeah. In 2010, I decided that was not what I was going to do. I, I, I wanted to follow my heart, and, I, and I, I asked God. He said, that's not where I want you. Mm -hmm. I want you over here. So I went. And I was in the middle of the desert. <clears throat> And they said, you want to go to El Centro? It's hot over there. I said, hot doesn't bother me. Yeah. I'm from Texas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I got over there, and it was 122 degrees. <laughs> I said, this is crazy. I don't know how people live like this. <laughs> this is insane. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, why do you have me here? I don't understand why I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't feel like the, sta the station um, accepted me right away. I had to fight. Um, I had to. I had to um, prove myself all over again. That's always uncomfortable, yeah. but necessary, I guess, and I did it. And then I asked, I said, well, I don't understand why, I, why I'm here. I'm not sure if this was for me, but I listened. And then I figured out why I was there. I was there to adopt, to, to become a foster parent and, and, and give some children a home and, and a place to stay that had no chance in life. Because um, their relatives were smugglers, and they practically threw these kids out on the street. So that's when, that was my charge, and I said, "Okay, now I get it. I'm gonna I'm gonna pour everything that I have into these children, and uh, and I'm gonna adopt them." And I sure did. After four years, we adopted them, and everything started to make sense to me. So I put God first, family second, and my career third. And once I did that, once I figured that combination out for me and I, f I figured well I'm never going to be unhappy now because I know my purpose my purpose is to serve others my purpose is to serve these children and I kept asking him where do you want to use me next and he said go back go back to the academy that's I said oh <clears throat> Again? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> let's go back. Yeah. So I think that's why I have you here. Like, you're right. If you're looking through the lens of, through your own lens, mm -hmm. like 20 years in the Border Patrol, you're only a supervisor. So what? Mm -hmm. There is a path for literally everybody. Right? I talked about up front, the probability of achieving executive leadership in an organization is very small. Yes. Right? So you can spend an entire career chasing that if you and that's okay too. You can absolutely do that. But you can't be let down if you don't achieve it. Right. Right. Or you can also take a different path. Maybe it sounds a lot like what your path was. Maybe it's, you know, you were just a border patrol agent your entire career, but you still led in different ways. Maybe you make it to patrol agent in charge, and that's okay too. But don't get mired down mm. in putting somebody else's uh, requirements onto your path. That's right. Right. You don't even know what they're thinking. But you clearly have to have a focus. You did, right? Something has to drive you. Sounds like faith, yeah. right? And when that opportunity presents itself, you got to be willing to see it. Yes. And I think that perfectly personifies personal leadership as well. Mm -hmm. So you're a leader uh, as, as a section leader. You're, uh, you know, a leader in the, in the um, sign cutting unit. You're a leader in, you know, the honor guard. Now you're leading two babies. Yes. Right? You tell me which one's more important. Mm, them. They're the most important thing in my life. Right? Yes. So leadership comes in all shapes and sizes, mm -hmm. forms. doesn't matter. You just got to be ready to accept whatever leadership role, whomever puts that in front of you. That's correct. Yes, 100%. Um, I, <clears throat> and I also saw the opposite. I saw um, my door is always open. Mm -hmm. And people come and they tell me what's on their mind. And sometimes when the, the, the people that are having the hardest time, our focus on other people. Absolutely. They have this and they have that. They're treating me like this. And I said, you, you cannot control that. You can control how you react to them. But ultimately, when you go home, that's, that's the most important thing. We, uh, just so for the record, we also don't pay you to be a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you're taking on a lot of roles here. 
<laughs> we don't we don't pay you to be a therapist, oh, I but <laughs> I, you know, I, I keep going back to it. It's, you know, it's, maybe it's getting a, a little played out, but people people go to people they trust, mm. right? A lot of times that often has uh, an implication of you're at least recognized in some form as a leader. You have bars on your collar. That's a leader position. And somebody is coming to you with their problems. Could be a peer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a, 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 an ascending leader above you. Sometimes it's just a board of Trojan or a trainee, right? But they go to you for a reason, mm -hmm. right? They're not coming to, you know, everyday Joe every, every single day with their problems. And you don't want to be the repository for everybody's problems, but they feel like if I just go to Myrna, she'll either step me straight, <laughs> right? Because that's really probably what they're after, quite honestly. If knowing Myrna, right, you're, you're not going to get a sugar-coated version of what you want to hear. That's right. Right? You're going to get the truth. Yes. You, like, hey, quit worrying about everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, find that opportunity. When it presents itself, take it. That's right. Right? And if it doesn't, find another opportunity. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's, that's uh, again, going back to what leadership's supposed to look like. That's what it is. <laughs> right? Yes. So you come back. Back to the Border Patrol Academy in 2018. Yes. All right. So tell me what, what that role was like. You learned all these lessons as a, as a first-line supervisor the first time. Do you apply them the second time? I didn't get a chance to, Chief. Okay. I did not tell me get about a that. chance to. Um, Chief Harris asked me to run the silent partner program yeah. for the country. Mm -hmm. And I said, of course. Are you kidding me? What an opportunity. So that's what I did for a year. And um, that's when I had the, the honor of meeting and getting to know Erica, you know, I get loud and all of these families that, that came to the academy and presented their silent partner on, on behalf of their loved one and they came to the graduations and they would come and interact and it was important for the students to see them, not to bring them down or not to make them sad, but to see, um, I tell Never them, forget. no, uh, this is what courage looks like. Right. This is what faith looks like. This is what... Uh, some of the bravest people I've ever met stood up in front of the class and they talked about their loved one. I can't do that. I know some very brave Border Patrol agents and they, they go and, and they do some very courageous things. But to stand in front of a classroom of strangers and talk to them about a loved one that you love with all your heart and they're no longer here with you, you're going to give your silent partner card to one of the students? That's courage. Yeah. So it's like I've never seen. For, for everybody listening is... Some, some time ago, this is uh, probably late 2000s, uh, five, seven, maybe six or seven, uh, a former chief of the academy uh, goes to a, a course developer, instructor, supervisory board of choice and says, hey, I need to do something with silent partners. I don't know what it looks like, what it's about, but we need to put this thing together. Yes. Um, so that CDI then goes out and comes up with this. Uh, I believe uh, he was using a Microsoft Publisher uh, at the time, <laughs> Microsoft Publisher. Huh. If anybody's ever dealt with that, good luck. Um, but anyway, put puts this program together where it's a it's a double sided card. Uh, what it has in the front is a picture with some biographical data, age, uh, da date of entry on duty, date of death, um, and time in service. These types of things. And in the back, it has a synopsis of the the events that led to uh, that person's death. Usually um, on duty, right? So line of duty death. Uh, and what we do with those cards, we print them in bulk. And every Border Patrol agent that walks through these doors since those days uh, is handed a silent partner card. And they have to essentially honor the legacy of that person by honoring their own legacy. Protect building and protecting and honor their own legacy. And this card just helps them uh, as an embedded uh, feedback mechanism to understand why that's important. Right. And, and we, we say it uh, not in any cliche way whatsoever is that we never forget. Mm -hmm. when, when we lose somebody, uh, we do our best, starting right here at the Border Patrol Academy where the legacy begins, right. to honor those people. 100% correct. Because a lot of those families, um, these agents, these officers, mounted watchmen, these pilots, their, their families are, are gone. So if these students don't s tell their story, their, their story is gone forever. And uh, it's so important that they, they carry on the legacy. Yeah. And to meet people that went through such a hard, I, I can't even wrap my mind around losing somebody like that in the line of duty. So I, put it, I tell them to put it in perspective. Mm -hmm. The academy's difficult. Mm -hmm. But when, even on your most difficult day, maybe you fell an exam, you, you did horrible in a run, maybe you had a couple of days, a couple of bad days back to back. It doesn't hold a candle to 
the amount of suffering that a family goes through when they lose somebody. So really think about that when you put it in perspective. Let these people motivate you and, and speak for the ones that cannot speak for themselves anymore. And that's what they do. They go out there and they, it, the presentation is not to bring them down. It's to show them what courage looks like. And they've met a, a lot of these families, and I learned a lot from them too. They say, you know, um, thank you for, for showing up at that funeral. Thank you for playing. You're thanking us. I cannot believe. They say, no, you, you helped me. My goodness gracious. Even uh, they inspire us as an honor guard. Say, That's what we do, what we do, and how, why it's important to do uh, all the work that goes into what we do because uh, for them. It's for them, and it's, and it's worth every second. It's worth, it, worth every second when you hear things like that from those families. Mm -hmm. So in 2020, Chief Owens, um, who obviously uh, everybody's familiar with, Chief Jason Owens, now the, the chief of the Del Rio sector, former chief of the Board Patrol Academy, um, asks you to become the commander of agents. Yes. Uh, this, for, for, the, for the record, this, this position or this title doesn't exist on our org chart. Right. Right? It's, it's a, it is a fabricated thing. But it was a necessary thing at the time. Um, and, of course, Chief Owens would ask you to be the first commander of agents at the Board Joe Academy. Tell me what the commander of agents does. What is your responsibility? Why, why did it come into existence? Uh, Chief wanted, had a vision of having an honor first branch. Um, under that had a resilien resiliency, the creation of an entry on duty team, the honor guard, um, peer support, chaplaincy, esprit de corps and everything else that runs along any one of those programs. Um, and he says, uh, and I want you to, uh, let's go. Let's, let's take this to the next level. I said, I am not qualified, <laughs> but I will give you my best. And, uh, and, uh, and I was learning along the way. And uh, my goodness, what an adventure. I've done that for the last two years, and it's been the, the highlight of my career. And I'm so honored and humbled to serve every single student and every single staff member here the way I do. Um, and I try to make them better every day, every single day, um, by just by listening to them, um, seeing how we can improve the academy, being their voice, pumping them up and encourage. And whenever I'm around them, I feel this charge of energy. As I'm, I'm looking to the future of the patrol, I'm saying, well, you guys have a tremendous job ahead of you. Mm -hmm. It's so important, instructors, that you all give them everything you've got, all of your knowledge pour into these students. Give, every, give them everything you've got because they're going out and they're going to be by our brothers and sisters on that front line that need to be ready. Yeah. Our brothers and sisters need help. Here they come. Here comes their, their help. They need to be ready when they hit the ground running. Yeah. Interestingly yeah. enough, you know, there's probably several people um, listening to the podcast today who have been through the U.S. Border Patrol Academy basic program. Mm -hmm. um, there was no commander of agents prior to two years ago. Make no mistake about this. This is not uh, a lessening of the standard. No standards have changed in this academy, whether it be some kind of curriculum change or the introduction of a commander of agents. Uh, what it does is just a maturation over time of being better, right? How do we foster an environment where learning is at an all-time high, Yes. right? Because to your point, we need Border Patrol agents, and there's no real excuse for uh, artificially creating a, a, an environment where uh, learning can be compromised, mm -hmm. right? And at the same time, instilling things like a spirit core, instilling things like honor first, mm -hmm. those types of things. So it's not a standard issue. Nothing has changed at the Border Patrol Academy. We're just literally trying to reinforce and personify, bring to life that the legacy truly starts here. Yes, it does. Right? The legacy of, the, of your career, start the legacy of the Border Patrol, starts at the Border Patrol Academy. That is a true story. Right, so it is important for everybody to understand that it comes through these doors, uh, have a healthy respect for that legacy, mm -hmm. and understand when you leave these doors as a graduate, that legacy only grows from there. Yes. And how you operate is a reflection of, of the legacy that you started right here. Yes, so. absolutely. And it's so important that we we hammer home the our mission and ha and, and understand and have them know what they're doing when they go out into the field. Mm -hmm. I think now more than ever, they understand how to do their job. Why we did not get the training that they, that they got 20 years ago, we did not get all these certifications, all of the, the um, 
the, the role play opportunity that they have to, to apply the Spanish, to apply the law, to see how they all fit together. We probably had one or two role play, and, and we always wanted more. We figured, wow, now I know how to apply that law. Now I understand. And then, boom, we'd graduate. Now they get an opportunity to ease into it, and, and um, they go through all. You see them at the beginning, and they're different people than six months in when they graduate. We see all the time. So we, we train different. to the terminal performance objectives of a board patrol agent. So essentially, when, when a trainee leaves these doors, they are prepared to handle most of the things that come up within, say, 90 to 100 days, mm -hmm. right? After that, it's a lot of OJT, field training unit, uh, learning from journeymen, yes. right? But they are more prepared and more qualified to be border patrol agents on day one than, frankly, you and I were. Oh, for 100%, yes. Right? Yes. And that's not a plug for the, for the Border Patrol Academy. It's just really an illustration that uh, as a learning organization, whether it be Border Patrol or more specifically in, 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 a, in a micro environment, the U.S. Border Patrol Academy, we owe it to the next generation of Border Patrol agents to prepare them in the best possible ways that we can do that today. Yes. Right? And in five years or, or two years or 10 years, it needs to be looked at again. It needs to be a revolving cycle. Learning organizations don't just happen, right? You have to push. And sometimes the thing takes things like creating a commander of agents to help, you know, really uh, hone in on the softer skills that aren't associated with, did you run well enough today? Did you shoot well enough today? Did you drive fast enough today? Those types of things. Is, there's so much more to being a border patrol agent than just the curriculum at the basic border patrol academy. That's right. And those are, that's really what you're charged with is instilling uh, and really inculcating those values into those trainees before they ever get out to uh, stations in the field. Yes, Chief. And that yeah. way they're more well-rounded. Yeah. And they know that there's support out there for them and there's support at sectors for them also if they need it. Yeah. Um, and hopefully they they have a lot of sense of pride when they graduate and they can't wait. They cannot wait. And they could, the uh, the EOD team um, was also created under, under Chief Owens mm -hmm. because we had so many different ways of EODing a class on a, Class first arrives, depending on who went out there to greet them, was the level of intensity or not. Yeah. And so we've created a standard, yeah. you know, but, um, and some people, uh, um, most uh, older mm -hmm. Border Patrol agents look at it and say, well, that wasn't as intense as mine. Um, you guys aren't training to, to, to standard. Uh, those two things are very different. Yeah. Um, the culture has evolved. We need to evolve with it. Um, otherwise, we're not going to be um, connecting with anybody um, because the days of do this because I said are are long gone. This generation wants to know why, what's what what is that what is the value, and then we 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 honed our skills as instructors as to showing them the value, of showing them how to do it. Oh, by the way, this is the end result, and this is what happens if you don't do it. They understand that, but that takes uh, that takes a lot of skill. To, and a lot, a lot of time, you know, as an instructor. That's why um, the people that are here as instructors for you and for the, at the academy right now, they want to be here. Yeah. They do. They want to be here, and you see them. If I'm ever having an off day, I just go in class, yeah. in a class, and I don't get that. The, I, I watch the instructor up there, and they are just, they are going, they're going for it because they know what's at stake. We don't do our job here. I say all the time. I have, a, I have a very unique command at the Border Patrol Academy. And insofar as everybody that works here as a permanent instructor, mm -hmm. right? Detailers notwithstanding, everybody that's here permanently, this is not their first duty location, which means they apply to come here. Yes. Said differently, they applied to come here because they wanted to be here for some reason. We have all kinds of coaches, mentors, uh, uh, folks that are that are really active in their church communities, mm -hmm. and they believe in in you know passing on values and teaching and instructing and coaching and making people better. Um, and and you're you're a hundred percent correct. Anytime you're having a bad day, you just go out to to watch somebody, anybody doesn't even matter, deliver some block of instruction, and you automatically and instantly feel that uh, they're not just going through the motions. No. They believe in what they're doing. They sure do. Right? And they're and they're trying to do their absolute best while they do it. Yes. I, I love that about that, uh, this command. Um, and it's different, right? So I could go be the chief of any sector in the Border Patrol, and it may be that, you know, somebody, this is their first duty location, and 
they're you know chasing a job here or there or the other and they can't get one so they become disgruntled this type of stuff but uh at the board show academy everybody elected to be here and i think that that really uh, plays out in the day-to-day execution of this mission it sure does yeah yes. so the reason i have you in here is because uh, as much as we hate to see you go you're off to uh, greener pastures <laughs> uh, apparently uh, uh, you've been called to texas Yes. Uh, to the Del Rio sector onto your next assignment. Uh, could not be more happier for you. Uh, like I said, we go way back and um, always admired uh, the way you operate and the, uh, the perception that what you do just comes easily to you. Mm-hmm. But you're going on to a new challenge. I sure so am. So I'd like to turn the, turn the mic over to you and maybe talk about the three or four things that are important to you now. We're on the What's Important Now podcast. So as you transition from the Border Patrol Academy into the Del Rio sector, you know, what are the three things that keep you up at night? The most important thing in my life is my faith. Yeah. That's number one. Um, I went um, <clears throat> to go look for a house in Brackettville, Texas, because mm-hmm. I'm going to be moving to Del Rio. And um, people said, are you going to go look for a home? And no, I, I was really going to look for a church. Yeah. I was really going to go look for a church, and I found one. And then the home's going to come. Yeah. Um, because if I try to force something or do it in the, in my time and not his time, mm-hmm. I'm going to spin my wheels or I'm going to, it's not going to be easy, but I operate in, in, in right in the center of his will. And then I kind of look around and I'm, I'm waiting for him to use me in any opportunity in any way that I can, mm-hmm. that he can use me. And if that's, if I get to Del Rio sector and they say, here's a mop, uh, go ahead and mop. I want you to be uh, mop the next the, the Del Rio sector for the next two years, and then you can retire. I say, okay, that's fine. It's not about what I'm doing, because I would be able to impact people mopping, right. <laughs> because that's I just right. want to talk to people, and and um, I'm a very different person when it comes to leadership. They ask me, what's your leadership philosophy? I've taught um, several classes. Um, I go in there and I and I and I stand up in front of everyone and I say, um, I used to do it wrong. Mm-hmm. I used to be uh, mean and I used to try intimidation, and then that didn't work. <laughs> I used to try. Um, I, I tried so many different, and then I just said, that's not working. You know, um, when I was over here in 07, and I watch other instructors, and the way uh, I would watch and see. Which instructors the students respected, mm-hmm. and it's instructors that really didn't say much, you know, and they just went in and they did their job. Mm-hmm. They showed the students what they needed to see in the border patrol agent, mm-hmm. and the students wanted to be just like that. I said, "There, there it is, there it is, right there." I need to keep my mouth shut. I need to listen. Mm-hmm. I need to watch people, and I need to I need to love on people. My leadership style is love. It's very unique. It's very different. And when I say that to people, people, especially senior seasoned agents, are like, come on, love, really? Mm-hmm. It's the truth because um, I don't ever ask anybody to do anything uh, unless I've already done it or doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then whenever they see the enthusiasm I have for any project you throw at me, I'm going to do it the best that I can because that's what I've seen my grandfather do and my mother and my father. And, and that's how um, that's how I'm going to raise these children. Yeah. And so it's it's God first, and then it's family, and then it's my job, and and every and everything else. And it's going to be in that order. And and I'm so happy. I'm so happy to have so much peace about that, um, because I'm not trying to be something I'm not. I'm not concerned with anybody else. And if my day goes sideways and um, I get a little bit jammed up for, because people can be real negative. And it, you can allow that to impact you in a way. Sometimes you go home at the end of the day and you go, wow, that was a rough one. But that's not me. I'm going to try to lift people up around me. I'm going to try to encourage them. And I'm going to try to pour everything that I have into the people around me and the mission that you give me. And so I hope that I've done that for you here and uh, and it's just truly been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think uh, 
the one takeaway I would I would offer from your your thing your top three things is just because there's an, a rank order one two three does not mean there's a lot of disparity between them, no. right? You can do one your number one while you're doing two and three, yes. Or doing two and three is really doing number one, <laughs> right? And that, that's it's it's perfectly said, um, and this is why I valued this conversation so much because it's really hard when you know once you get to a certain you know a level in the organization you kind of want to put like a strategic operational or you know interesting lens over what's important now but leadership doesn't require that you have some really awesome tenants or, or programs you're working on it just requires loving people yes that's right it. so you know extra authority by way of rank means nothing mm-hmm. when it comes to just being who you are Right. Showing the love that you aspire to show mm-hmm. and looking for those opportunities. And when they present themselves, answering that call. Yes. And, and listening. Thank yeah. you so much. Well, Marina, we wish you the absolute best in the Del Rio sector. Del Rio sector's gain is, is the Academy's loss <laughs> for sure. Um, it's, it's my loss personally, for sure. I mean, it, it, like I, it wasn't uh, tongue in cheek when I said that, you know, I walk in every day, uh, for context, you're, I walk by your office uh, every single day yes. when I when I enter mine, and um, it's truly the highlight of my day. So you will be well, missed. Thank you so much. And I cannot wait uh, to see what uh, what God puts in front of you uh, between now and uh, the rest of your days. <laughs> yes, I can't wait. He's got something big. Yeah. And okay. I tell him, I said, I'm not, I'm not qualified. Yeah. Said, be patient. I'll qualify yeah, you. Just yeah. listen. <laughs> awesome. I definitely want to. Uh, I don't think there's any better way to sign off than uh, thanking you for all that you've done for the Border Patrol and the Border Patrol Academy. And uh, like I said, we look forward to great things. And with that, honor first.